Strategy of History by Lawrence Friedman, Oxford Press. Page 75, Napoleon's Strategy. Napoleon preferred to keep the critical ingredients behind his approach beyond explanation. The art of war, he insisted, was simple and commonsensical. It was, quote, all in execution, nothing about it is theoretical. The essence of the art was simple. With a numeric, numerically inferior army, it was necessary to have larger forces than the enemy at the point, which is to be attacked or defended. How best to achieve that was an art that could be learned neither from books nor from practice. This was matter for the military genius and therefore for intuition. Napoleon's contribution to strategy was not so much in his theory but in his practice. Nobody could think of better ways of using great armies to win great wars. Napoleon was not creating new forms of warfare completely from scratch. He was building on the achievements of Frederick the Great, the most admired commander of his time. Frederick was king of Prussia from 1740 to 1786 and a reflective and prolific writer on war. His success was the result of turning his army into a responsive instrument, well trained and held together by tough discipline. Initially he preferred his wars to be short and lively, which required accepting battle. Long wars exhausted the state's resources as well as its soldiers, and Frederick's country was relatively poor. His seizure of Silesia during his reign, during the War of Austrian Succession, made his reputation as a tactical genius. Whitman uses this campaign as a prime example of how a law of victory could ensure restraint so long as both sides accepted battle as a form of wager. Frederick observed that battles decide the fortune of states and could put an end to a dispute that otherwise might never be settled. As kings were subject to no superior tribunal, combat could decide their rights and judge the validity of their reasons. Over time, however, Frederick became more wary of battle due to his dependence upon chance. Success might need to come through the accumulation of small gains rather than a single decisive encounter. Unlike Napoleon, Frederick preferred to avoid fighting too far from his own borders, did not expect to destroy the opposing army in battle, and avoided frontal attacks. His signature tactic was the oblique order, an often complex maneuver requiring a disciplined force. It involved concentrating forces against the enemy's strongest flank while avoiding engagement on his own weak flank. If the enemy did not succumb, an orderly retreat would still be possible. If the enemy flank was overrun, the next step was to wheel round and roll up his line. What Frederick shared with Napoleon and what later theorists celebrated in both was the ability to create strength on the battlefield even without an overall numer numerical advantage and directed against an enemy's vulnerabilities. As a young officer, Napoleon also read Guibert and took from him some basic ideas which he made his own. In particular, he noted the need to launch attacks at the key points where superior, superiority had been achieved and to reach these points by, quickly, by moving quickly. Although Guibert had observed that hegemony over Europe will fall to that nat nation which becomes possessed of manly virtues and creates a national army, he had not seen conscription as the means to this end. He assumed the duties of a citizen and a soldier to be opposed. At most, a militia might be raised as a defensive force. The actual creation of the mass army can be credited to Lazar Carnot, a key figure in the French Revolution who had an uneasy relationship with Napoleon but served him until 1815. It was Carnot who as Minister of War used conscription to create the levée en masse and turned it into a formidable, trained, and disciplined organization. Carnot also showed how a mass army could be used as an offensive instrument by separating it into independent units that could move faster than the enemy, enabling attacks against the flanks and creating opportunities to cut off communications. Most of Napoleon's generals learned their trade under Carnot. Napoleon's contribution was to grasp how the potential of the mass army could be realized. He imbibed the military wisdom of the Enlightenment and took advantage of the system created by Carnot in such a way as to upset not only traditional thinking about war, but also the whole European balance of power. His genius lay not in the originality or novelty of his ideas on strategy, but in their interpretation and context and the boldness of his execution. His focus was always on the decisive battle. He was prepared to embrace the inherent brutality of war 
and sought to generate sufficient concentrated violence to shatter the opposing army. This was the route to the political goal. An enemy with a broken army would be unwilling to resist political demands. As this required a comprehensive defeat, Napoleon had little interest in indirect strategies. When a point of weakness was found, extra forces would be poured in to break through. They could then move against the enemy from the rear or to the flanks. This required taking risks, for example, accepting vulnerabilities to his own rear and flanks as he concentrated strength. But Napoleon was not reckless. He would wait until the right moment to make his move. Since he put a priority on ensuring that he had the maximum strength, his great battles were often fought in obscure places where he saw an opportunity to strike with guaranteed superiority and utter ruthlessness. By combining political and military authority in one person, Napoleon was able was also in a position to act boldly without extensive consultations. His optimism, self-confidence, and extraordinary run of victories earned him the loyalty of his troops and kept his enemies apprehensive. This created a sense of irresistibility which he was always keen to exploit. Napoleon never provided a complete account of his approach to war. He did not write of strategy, although he did refer to the higher parts of war. His views were recorded in a number of maxims. They were often practical reflections on the standard military problems of his day and lacked the universal quality of Sun Tzu's writings. Yet they captured the essence of his approach, bringing superior strength to bear at crucial moments. God is on the side of the heaviest battalions, defeating the enemy by destroying his army, viewing strategy as the art of making use of time and space, using time to gain strength when weaker, and compensating for physical inferiority with greater resolve, fortitude, and perseverance. The moral is to the physical is three to one. Many of his maxims revolved around the need to understand the enemy. By fighting too often with one enemy, you will teach him all your art of war. Never do what the enemy wishes for this reason alone, that he desires it. Never interrupt an enemy making a mistake. Always show confidence, for you can see your own troubles, but you cannot see those facing your enemy.